Hi guys, I hope you are studying hard and I'm going to be putting together just short review videos for each unit. Instead of having a review session on campus, I think this will be easier for everybody to um, benefit from the reviews. So what I'm going to do in each one of these videos is just go over the learning objectives. So if you want to get the most out of studying and increase your chances of doing well on the Bio 1020 exams, what you really want to focus on are these learning objectives at the beginning of every chapter, or I guess they're at the end of every unit. And then below that are also glossary terms. So make sure you are reviewing all these glossary terms because you're going to have to be able to recall any of these terms during the exam. Also, just remember that after the learning objectives and after the glossary terms, there is a short summary of everything you know, that was covered in that unit. So I would recommend reading over that, making sure that you understand all that information. In addition, you also have the PowerPoints online that you can review. So I would look over those. And then when you feel really comfortable with the material, go through the sample problems that you turned in at the end of each unit and make sure you understand how to solve those type of problems. And also remember that there are two practice exams in your lab manual and they're after units one through four. So the first exam will cover units one through four and I will do a separate little video for each one of those units. So I'm gonna start on page nine. So that's going over the learning objectives for unit one. So if you would like to follow along with me, you would want you want to get out page nine of your lab manual. All right, so the first thing that's on the learning objectives is to be able to distinguish between inferences and assumptions. So just remember that an assumption is a statement that doesn't have any evidence to really support it or back it up. Whereas an inference is a statement based on evidence. So there's some sort of evidence provided that backs up that statement. So let's look at a sample question about assumptions and inferences. So here we can see that a biologist is interested in looking at the relationship between the age of giant panda bears and their weight. The data she collected are below. So in the first column here, you can see the age in days. And in the second column here, you can see the weight. In kilograms. So if she estimates, estimates that the weight at 40 days is 2 kilograms, is she making an inference or an assumption? Well, if we look, 40 days would fall right in here and it's within the range of data that she collected. So for her to make an estimate of about 2 kilograms, that makes sense. And she's making this estimate within the range of data that was collected, so this would be an inference. However, what if she estimates that the weight at 10 days is 0.5 kilograms? Well, if we look here, we didn't collect any data less than 25 days. So, although 0.5 kilograms might you know, actually be a good estimate, what she is doing here is making an assumption. She's assuming that the trend is going to continue outside of the range of data that we collected. So this is just one example of a type of question you might get requiring you to remember or know whether something is an inference or an assumption. Let's move on now to the second learning objective. This says formulate hypotheses and describe the relationship between hypotheses and predictions. So this is probably one of the most difficult concepts, I would say, from Unit 1. Many students have a difficult time telling the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. So let's first look at the definition of both of these. A hypothesis is a testable and falsifiable explanation of a natural phenomenon. Okay, so it's some sort of explanation for what is expected to happen. However, what you notice here that it also clearly states a causation. So it clearly states why you would expect this to happen. And this is a really important part here, the why. So whenever something is a hypothesis, it has to explain why you think you're going to see what you're going to see. If the why is not included, then it's simply a prediction. A prediction is simply an expected outcome. 
So it may imply causation. You might be able to see or, you know, you might be able to decipher what the causation would probably be just from the statement. However, if it does not clearly state the causation, then it's just a prediction. Let's look at an example of this. So here I have three different statements. And let's see which of these are hypotheses and which are predictions, or maybe some of these are neither. So let's look at the first one here, A. If children drink more sugar-sweetened beverages, then they will show a higher occurrence of type 2 diabetes. So here, the link I'm looking at is, you know, increasing sugar-sweetened beverages in their diet, and I'm saying that it's going to result in these type 2 diabetes increasing. It doesn't clearly state why this link would exist. So in this case, A would simply be a prediction. So here, although I could, I mean, it implies that's the sugar causing the type 2 by diabetes, it doesn't clearly state that. And because it doesn't clearly state that, it can't be a hypothesis. Let's look at the second example here. We have here where it says, consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages increases blood glucose and insulin concentrations. Therefore, greater consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages will result in a higher occurrence of type 2 diabetes. Well, here, does it clearly state why we expect to see this link? It does. So if you look here, right here it says that consumption of these sugar-sweetened beverages will increase blood glucose and insulin concentrations. So that is why this link exists and why we expect to see that. So B is a hypothesis. The causation is clearly stated. I'm just going to abbreviate that. That's the hypothesis. If we look at C, it says the frequency of type 2 diabetes in children is increasing in the United States. Well, here, this is just a statement saying what is currently happening. So this is neither a prediction or a hypothesis. This is an observation. So this is simply an observation of what is currently happening. Okay, so you can see the differences here and notice that for the hypothesis, the statement that's hypothesis, there was a clear causation stated there. So anytime you get to a problem like this, look and ask yourself, is it explaining why? Is it clearly stated in there why I expect to see what I'm going to see? Now let's move on to learning objective three. This says recognize the dependent and independent variables in an experiment and describe the role of a control in an experiment. So remember that an experiment has multiple components to it. So one thing that it has is called the independent variable. This is the variable that's responsible for causing a change in another variable. This is usually what the experiment per experimenter purposely manipulates between each group because they want to test its effect on something else. The dependent variable, on the other hand, is the response variable. It responds to the changes in the independent variable. Okay. We also will have what we call treatments. These are groups that have different levels of the independent variable, and this is how we can test how the independent variable is causing a change in something else. One thing that you have to remember about these treatments is that the only thing that you want different between each treatment is the independent variable itself. Every other factor needs to remain the same or be constant. Otherwise, we can have some things confounding the results of our study. Usually also, you will want a control group. This is a group where the independent variable is eliminated or set to some standard value. The control group and the purpose of it is to actually have a group for comparison to see what would happen maybe you know if the independent variable didn't even exist at all. So let's look at an example here. A scientist is interested in studying the effect of a high sugar diet on memory in children. He tests three groups, 
Group one has no sugar added to their diet. Group two is fed a low sugar diet. And group three is fed a high sugar diet. After three weeks on their diet, the scientist measures each child's memory by recording how many words they can remember from a list of 10 words. So take a second. If you need to pause the video, pause it. And I want you to pick out what is the dependent variable? What is the independent variable? Is there a control group in this um, study as well? So if we look here and we look for what the independent variable is. So remember, this is the thing that is being purposely manipulated between each group. This is the thing that is causing a change in something else. So what is the experimenter manipulating between each group? Well, if you look here, what they are manipulating between each group is the amount of sugar. One group has no sugar, the other one has low sugar, and the other group has high sugar. So our independent variable, I'm going to abbreviate it IV, because it's harder to write with this pen, the independent variable equals the amount of sugar. So if we look here for the dependent variable, the dependent variable is the variable that is causing, or the variable that is the response to the changes in the amount of sugar. It's dependent on the sugar. So if we look here, well, what is dependent on the sugar? Well, I mean, we're looking at the effect of the sugar on the child's memory. And how are we measuring that? We're recording how many words they can remember. So in this case, the dependent variable would be the number of words they can remember. Okay, because that is what is in response to changing the sugar. So now we know the independent variable is the amount of sugar. The dependent variable is the number of words they can remember. And do we have a control here? Well, if we look here, we can see that we do have a control. We have a group where the independent variable is eliminated. So this is our comparison group. We want to know how many words a child can remember with no sugar added at all. So group one, the group that's not receiving any extra sugar in their diet, would be our control. Okay, so hopefully now you feel a little bit more comfortable with picking out the independent variable and dependent variable in an experiment. The next objective asks us to distinguish between experimental and sampling errors. So there's two types of errors that are typically made when doing a scientific experiment. One is called sampling errors. These are sampling methods that result in samples that are not representative of the whole population or group. And there's a couple different things that can lead to a sampling error. So you get an estimate based on the sample and it doesn't really represent the real population. Well, one thing that can lead to that is just having too small of a sample size. If you only take out a few individuals from the population, there's a good chance that they don't actually represent the population as a whole. Another thing that can lead to a sampling error is a bias sampling. In this case, you aren't picking individuals randomly, but you're being biased in how you're picking them. So you might, if you're measuring the height of students um, on the campus and you only measure the height of students on the basketball team, well, that's bias sampling. You're not measuring from the natural variation that would occur in the actual school population. Let's look at the other type of error. This would be an experimental error. So this is a procedural fault, something that's done wrong when actually doing the experiment. So this could include things like maybe equipment not working properly, or maybe equipment not measuring things accurately. Um, also just like mistakes like measure in measuring, using the wrong units or something like that would be an example of experimental errors. Let's look at an example, um, an example question. And on the exam, if we ask you what type of error did, was made in this experiment, don't write some long explanation. We're looking for the word sampling error or experimental error. So you should pick one of those to answer with. 
So let's look at this example. Your friend tells you he just stocked his new pond with 100 catfish, which have an average length of 15 centimeters. You don't believe him because you just caught five catfish by the shoreline with an average length of only 10 centimeters. What type of error did you make? Hmm. Well, if we look here, the sample size that you had was only five catfish out of the hundred that were stocked in that pond. Also, you only caught these fish by the short line, which are probably smaller fish than what it would be in the deeper waters. So the type of error you made here, can you guess? It is actually called a sampling error. In this case, you kind of, you have a small sample size as well as not having a very large. So you, don't, you have a small sample size as well as having bias sampling because you collected by the shore. Let's look at another example, example here. So this is the same thing at the beginning here. Your friend tells you they stocked the pond with 100 catfish. They have an average length of 15 centimeters. You sample 20 fish from the pond and get a measurement of 6 centimeters. However, you didn't realize you measured in inches instead of centimeters. What type of error did you make? Well, in this case, it would be an experimental error, okay, because you are actually measuring with the wrong units, okay? Hopefully, you are able to tell the difference now between a sampling error versus one that's just based on procedural faults. So when you answer a question that is an experimental error like this, do not write down human error. I know some people call would call this a human error. This, and technically, at least in this class, is called an experimental error. Human error is a type of experimental error. All right, let's move on. So the next objective says find the mean and median for a set of data. You should probably also know when one is more appropriate to use than the other. So when do we use mean and median? Well, we use both of these to kind of get an idea of where most of the data falls. So to kind of get the central tendency of the data. If you look here, I have two sets of data. One over here on the left and one over on the right here. So let's practice calculating the mean and the median. The mean is simply the same thing as the average. So in order to calculate that, you just add all the numbers up. 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 8. And you write that down there. And then you divide that by the total number of numbers. Then there's 9 in this data set. So this is the mean that I'm calculating. And don't forget uh, to double check to make sure you calculate everything correctly because this, this is the second time I'm doing this part of the video because I actually made an experimental error. So hopefully I'm correct this time. So 48 divided by 9 and that would equal 5.33. The median, on the other hand, is you just look for the middle number and since we have nine numbers this is the fifth number here and that's in the middle so in order to calculate the median you first have to put all the numbers in order from lowest to highest and then the middle value is your median okay so both of these look like pretty good measurements of central tendency. Most of the numbers do fall around five and that's what the mean and median are telling us. Let's look at this other data set here. So here I have eight numbers and you can see we have some outliers here. So let's see how that affects our measurements of central tendency. So let's first calculate the mean. So I have to add all these numbers up. And when I did that, I got 64. And then I'm going to divide by the total number of numbers. That's 8. And my answer is 8 for that. For my median,
Well, that is the cent middle number. Well, if I look here, since I have an even number of numbers, I have two numbers that are in the middle, five and six. So the way you calculate the median is you just take the average of those two numbers in the middle. So you do five plus six divided by two, and that would give me 5.5. So which of these numbers, the mean or the median, give me a better estimate of the central tendency? Well, most of the numbers are less than six, right? There might be around 5.5. It's just these outliers here that are skewing our mean. So I would say in this case, median is a better estimate of what you would typically see within this data set. All right, so we have two more objectives left in unit one. And the next one is construct histograms, bar graphs, and line graphs when given appropriate data. So a histogram, another word for a histogram is a frequency distribution. So this is telling you how often a set of values occur in a, a population. Okay, so how often do we see these, um, these certain numbers? So I'll show you an example of that in a second. A line graph is when you're looking at some sort of functional relationships. If you're looking at how one variable affects another variable. So a lot of times we call this cause and effect. Whereas a bar graph is whenever you're looking at categorical data or discrete data. So you actually have different categories like male versus female and you're comparing those categories. Or you might have um, tall versus short, or you might be comparing multiple species and looking at some, some variable in these species and you're actually graphing each species on the graph. Okay, So these are examples, these are the three types of graphs that you need to be familiar with. If you look at a data set, you should know which type of these graphs is most appropriate to use to graph that data. So let's look at a, an example of this. So if we look at this first group over here, what type of graph would be best to use in this situation? Well, this says hind femur lengths and several species of neoconocephalus. All right, so here we can see these different species. And it's telling us the femur length here. Well, these are categories. So what type of graph would you use? You would have a bar graph. And the way you would graph this is these categories would go on the x-axis and the femur length would go on the y-axis. And you would have a bar to represent each species. Let's look at the next example over here. So here it says student heights in bio 1020. So here we have the height, which are numbers, and we have the number of students over here. So this is telling us the number of students or the frequency of students that have each height. What type of graph would you use in this case? A histogram, because this is a frequency distribution. So notice how a histogram differs from a bar graph. A bar graph has categories over here, whereas a histogram has numbers on both axes. And one of the axes, which is your y-axis, would have the number of something. So if you look at how I would graph it, I would graph it like this. You can actually group the numbers on the x-axis together. So I'm looking at the number of students that have a height between 60 and 65, or a height between 66 and 70, and a height between 71 and 75. And you can just graph it like that. Would I get complete credit for this graph if I put it on an exam? Stare at it for a second and see what's wrong with this graph. So what is missing here is actually the units for height. This graph, if I just had it like this, I don't know whether that person measured in millimeters, meters, inches, centimeters. So you must always make sure that you include the units, and in this case, they're inches and you have to include that in parentheses at the end. So to get complete credit for this, you would have had to include inches in there. 
Let's look at our last example here. Here we're looking at the relationship between hours of sleep per night and test scores. So here I'm looking at cause and effect. All right, so I'm looking at how sleep, the hours of sleep affect test scores. So since I'm looking at a cause and effect and I have just numbers, I have to grab this as a line graph. All right, because then I would be graphing the time slept on the x-axis and the test scores on the y-axis because on your x-axis that's always the independent variable and that's the thing that's causing a change in something else well the time slept is what's going to affect the test score right not the other way around let's look at another example here this is similar so this is something that you might get on the exam. A professor is interested in looking at the relationship between time spent studying, this time not sleeping, but studying, and the grade on their exam. The data she collected are below. So this is a time spent studying, and this is a test scores. Okay, don't be this student here. Well, you're already not this student because you're watching this video. So how would I graph this? And what goes on the x-axis? Well, what goes down here? would be the independent variable. So what is causing what here? What's the thing causing a change? So that would be the time spent studying, okay? So the time spent studying would go down here. Time studying. It's really hard to write with this pen, so I apologize for my sloppy writing. Time studying and I got to write hours. Okay, don't forget your units. Then here, I can label my axes. I'm just going to make each square equal one hour. So it's four, six, eight. And then here would be my test scores. So I'm going to make I think I have like 10 squares at least, so I can make each square be 10%. So this would be 20. This one would be 40. Oops, that's a four. This one would be 60. This one will be 80. And this one will be 100. Don't forget you have to also label this axis. So this is test score. And don't forget to put that in per the units percent. All right, and then you need to have a title up here, but I'm not gonna write the title because that would take too long. And then you got to start graphing. So zero at 20%, put a little dot there. Two hours would go up to 35. Oh, that's 40, see, can't even tell. Four hours would go up to 60. Six hours would go up to 80. And eight hours would go up to 94 should be probably about here. Am I done? You're not done yet. You always have to do your best fit line. So your best fit line, you want to try to follow the trend of the data. So I'm going to try my best to draw this up here. Just like that. And then you want to stop there. Do not continue your line up here. That is called extrapolation. And you do not want to do that because then you're assuming the line is going to keep going and you never know. Maybe it would just plateau. You know, maybe you could. Maybe this test is impossible, and no matter how hard students study, they never would get a hundred percent. That's not true for Bio 1020, though. You can get a hundred percent. You just got to study hard. All right. So hopefully you feel better about graphing. Let's move on to the last objective. The last objective asks you to distinguish between interpolation and extrapolation. So. An interpolation is very similar to an inference. An extrapolation is very similar to an assumption. 
An interpolation is what you're doing when you're drawing a best fit line. Here, you're kind of making a guess of what the trend would look like, even in areas where you didn't collect the data. Okay, so you're trying to understand what the general trend is. So here I'm looking at shell length versus shell weight. If I draw my line like this, I'm inferring that this is the trend that I would see between my data. So an interpolation is any type of estimate of a value within the range of the measured data collected. Okay, so it's very similar to an inference again. So although I didn't collect any information at 70 millimeters, I could estimate that a shell at the length of 70 millimeters would have the weight of about 80 grams. That is an interpolation. An extrapolation would be estimating a value outside the range of measured data or extending your line beyond the data range measured. You do not want to extend your line out here. You do not want to make this kind of assumption. Okay, so if I were to say, hmm, maybe around, uh, let's see, 60 millimeters, it's going to weigh 55 grams. Well, that would be an extrapolation. I didn't collect any data less than about 65 millimeters, so I can't make those estimations.